Welcome to the Adam Does Movies podcast. I'm Adam. Halloween's right around the corner. So I thought, what better way to celebrate than prepare a list of the top 10 best horror movie soundtracks. Basically the theme songs that I can't live without. Are they the definitive? Uh, I put it together, so yeah, I think, I think it is. <laughs> now obviously, it's subjective. We're all gonna have different tastes. We're all gonna have different ideas of what uh, constitutes as iconic and the greatest, but I'm very, I'm very proud of this list I put together. I took some notes. I shout out all the composers on here and I give a small little synopsis of the movie itself to kind of, you know, trigger uh, my memories of it and just help me flow through this podcast without stumbling over my own words and, and trying to think of things. Anyway, I'd love to know if you are enjoying these podcasts. I've been doing them for a couple months now. I'm having a good time. I hope you are too. If you're watching on YouTube, please let me know. Leave a comment, like it, share it, believe in it. If you are on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or any podcast service of your choice, I'd love a like there too, rate it, do whatever you need to do to uh, uh, share this and get this known to the world because I need the support. I would really appreciate it. All right, before I begin, I want to also point out that upcoming on the live show, which I do two times a week, a lot of these also get put up to podcasts, I'm going to be covering the Scream movies. We've been going through them as a family, really enjoying them. I think it's one of the most consistently solid horror movie franchises around. You look at things like Halloween, it very much dips in quality over the course of the films. You look at Friday the 13th, the same thing can be said. I mean, across the board, it's kind of a complete shit show. But Scream, even at its lowest point, which to me is Scream 3, I still stand by that so far from what I've watched, it's very entertaining. There's still some fun in there, there's still some great kills, some good twists, you're still engaged with it. Yeah, I think Scream is an absolute win across the board. Uh, I, I would love to hear your thoughts. Anyway, I'm going to be talking about that in an upcoming episode. And again, I'm talking about uh, movie scores today, soundtracks from scary films. But we got a lot to cover. I mean, I want to do an episode on my favorite movie themes, favorite movie scores just full stop, whether it's Harry Potter or Star Wars or whatever. I want to do a list of those, maybe 20, maybe 30. We'll see where it takes us. That will probably be a live episode, maybe early, uh, maybe late next week, maybe the following after we get out of October. And that way I can get your support and your participation in the comments there when we do a live. All right, let's start with our list and we're going to do one shout out. I have 10 on mine. I have one special shout out to a TV show because this is a movie list, not a TV list, but I have to mention Stranger Things. That intro, with the synth wave sound, which really is a callback to the 80s with things like the Terminator and Halloween and The Thing. Kyle Dixon and Michael Stein from the band Survive composed this. I'm looking over at my notes right now because there's no way I'd remember any of that. They are the ones that did this theme. I think it's one of the most iconic new scores we've had in a long time. Since probably... The Harry Potter theme, honestly, I can't think of anything that rivals that in terms of staying power, in terms of, oh my god, I, when I hear this sound, I think immediately of this. And that's what we have with the Duffer Brothers uh, Stranger Things TV series. All right, uh, this is in no particular order. I see I kind of started with the best of the best, and that's probably fine and expected. Halloween. At the tender age of six... Michael Myers, without warning, stabs his sister. He gets sent off to prison. 15 years later, he comes back home to finish what he started. Uh, go on more of a killing rampage. This movie has withstood the test of time. This is John Carpenter at his finest, right at... This is the same guy that brought us The Thing. He is a vision. He's a visionary. And his vision is scary. This is uh, extra fun because... <laughs> The, the, the budget for Halloween was $300,000. That's nothing. That's less than nothing for a feature-length film. So John Carpenter had nothing left in his wallet to hand over to a composer. So what's he do? Well, he grabs, uh, he grabs himself a local synth player and he does it himself. 
He comes up with five or six different versions of this theme, and what he ends with is an absolute banger. This thing is a driving force for Michael Myers as he pops out of bushes, as he just stands ominously in the distance, staring you down. This film, the score, really brings you into the picture. It's just a threatening vibe, and you hear it everywhere every Halloween. It'll be played when you go up to doors and grab candy. It'll be played when you're mugging a child for their candy. It's there somewhere, and when you think about it, you think, where's Michael? Where's this psychotic 21-year-old wielding a knife and a mask and a piss-poor attitude? Where is he hiding? I love, I love this score. And I, I really just have to say, music is such an important part. This is an obvious, right? Music is such an important part of movies. A major theme song can elevate a film. I can't really honestly think of an amazing movie that doesn't also have an amazing theme with it. All of my favorite movies, I mean, like The Godfather, tremendous score. Jurassic Park, obviously. The Matrix. They all have iconic, timeless soundtracks. And, and they, they elevate the material. That's the important piece, is they elevate the material. They're a perfect companion. Speaking of that, Psycho is the next one on my list. Marion Crane is on the lam after stealing $40,000. This is pretty much a red herring, though. It has nothing to do with the actual plot, which is her taking shelter at the Bates Motel. This thing's run by Norman Bates. To say he's got a few screws loose would be an understatement. This guy is not well. He's peeping on the people. He's got his own little video collection of some of the people that have been staying there uh, over the years. And uh, Crane's going to find out the hard way what happens when you don't really succumb to his advances. Uh, she gets stabbed several times in the shower in one of the most... Uh, not to use, overuse the word iconic, but it really is one of the most iconic scenes in movie history. The beautifully framed black and white shot of her freaking out as the knife blades go in. Reet, 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 and you hear that score by the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock. As that blade goes in, Bernard Herrmann is the one responsible for this composition. We see that blood spinning down the drain. Oof. The re, 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 the re, 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 it's been parodied, it's been mimicked, it's been studied, it's been utilized so many times over the years in film. But we know where it started. We got gremlins. A gadget salesman brings home a Christmas present for his son, Billy. Chaos ensues. A mogwai comes out of that box. I can't do his whistling, but it's beautiful. His, his music is absolutely beautiful. What's not so pretty is what he turns into when he's fed after midnight or gets wet. I think it has the same effect. I'm not, honestly, I'm not really sure if there's, a, is there a difference? Whatever. Whenever he gets wet, a bunch of ugly-ass offspring fly out and they turn into these disgusting gremlins. They're going to terrorize everything. We all know the movie, I would imagine. I think this is a... Oh, I was going to say Danny Elfman, but it's not. It's Jerry Goldsmith. The, the theme song is The Gremlin Rag. You can hear some drums to start things out, followed by that terrific, fun, upbeat, yet dark, almost Tim Burton-esque theme song that goes throughout this movie and the sequel and that new animated show that I don't know anybody watches. This, <laughs> this is such a great theme and I really, I honestly don't think this movie would be near as much of a classic if this didn't knock it out of the park. But it does and the movie is a classic. Alright, speaking of Danny Elfman, here he is and again... It's got a Tim Burton feel, but this time it's very appropriate because this is a Tim Burton movie, Beetlejuice. After Barbara and Adam die in a car wreck, not me, a, a different Adam played by uh, Alec Baldwin, they elicit the help of a sketchy, <laughs> a sketchy spook named Beetlejuice to help remove the new homeowners. There's new people that moved into their house because they died. And so Beetlejuice comes along and like, hey, you want to get these guys out of here? I'll do it. Just, you know, you hold me up. I'll help you out. 
It's 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 Michael Keaton. Always awesome. Just as we got a sequel coming out for Beetlejuice. A million years later, sequel's coming out. I'm scared. I haven't seen any Tim Burton movies in a long time that I've liked, but he used to make some bangers. Actually, I'm going to be watching one on Halloween with my family. I'm actually very excited about this. I haven't seen Sleepy Hollow in a long ass time. Is that Tim Burton? I better look that up. Sleepy Hollow director. It's got to be Tim Burton. Okay, it is. Whew. Yeah, Tim Burton did Sleepy Hollow, Johnny Depp, I believe, uh, Christy, now I'm gonna, see now, I didn't write notes for this, now I'm gonna screw up, the Adams Family, or Christina Ricci, I think, Sleepy Hollow, IMDB, let me look really quick, because I don't want to, I don't want to say a bunch of stupid stuff, I think it's Christina Ricci, yeah, Christina Ricci, Johnny Depp, Michael Gambon's in this, okay, Casper Van Dion? What? Yeah, Christopher Walken. Christopher Walken has like a two-second cameo at the beginning because he's the headless horseman when it starts. That's so funny that Casper Van Dien's in this from Starship Troopers. He was kind of the up-and-coming actor for a while and then just completely fell on its face. Started doing a bunch of straight-to-VHS, straight-to-DVD movies like Viper, which is a basically a clone of Anaconda. Viper's hilariously bad. I love that movie. Let me stay focused, though. Yeah, this is a Danny Elfman movie. It's very playful. It's very wacky. Uh, like, it, it's Tim Burton, down to a T. Oh, down to a, down to a T. it did it when there's something strange in your neighborhood. This is a song that's played at every roller rink in existence. Now roller rinks don't really exist. So that was a sad statement and it aged me horribly. But I used to love going there, skating my heart out to this theme song. Oh man, Ray Parker Jr. Let, let's talk about the synopsis. Gozer and his minions start terrorizing New York City. Who are you gonna call? Well, a few schlubby guys that uh, really can't seem to make ends meet. Scientists that are a little out of their gourd. You have a human equivalent of a used car salesman with Bill Murray. <laughs> this is such a awesome team of guys coming together to try to flip a quick buck. But in the process, they're actually saving the city. It's, an, it's a hilarious premise with really funny people. Plus you got Sigourney Weaver in here. I mean, everything's a win. Rick Moranis is in the mix. Uh, yeah, I, lo I love this movie. Ray Park, you know who else loves this movie? And the theme song is Huey Lewis in the News. This just in, Ray Parker Jr., you're getting sued. Huey Lewis says, hey, you know what? This song sounds an awful lot like a new drug. And they're not wrong. I, I want a new drug. It has that, you know, bum, 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 bum. Skip a bang, bang, dang, dang, dang. It's very close. So they did end up suing Ray Parker and winning. They settled. Uh, it's a sad situation. I love both of these songs. And I don't actually honestly ever conflate the two. There's a song by Vanilla Ice. You may have heard of it. It's called Ice Ice Baby, which is almost identical to a Queen song. I forgot the name of the Queen song. But uh, the background beats. Dun, 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 dun almost identical and uh vanilla ice is <laughs> he's like no there's there's one more there's one more duh dun 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 yeah very funny and i don't i think he won that too so yeah you just never know get better lawyers all right jaws dun 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 scan and dun dun scan and dun 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 martin brody attempts to save a small town from a shark attack after a young woman is brutally killed at the beginning of the film, he's like, hey, you know what? There's a shark cruising the coast. Let's keep everybody at bay. Uh, the uh, local officials, not so thrilled on that idea, especially when this is the big season. All the tourists come in. It brings a lot of money. And if the beach is closed, so are the cash registers. So is the funding for the year. Well, they're going to keep this open. Martin has to take it into his own hands. He, uh, he gets the help. He solicits the help from a local uh, shark hunter uh, named Quint. He, he's, he's the best of the best, at least that he knows. He's also very dicey, but he's going to get the job done. And then you have a, I, I wrote the name down because I can't, 
Ike Theologist. I was going to just say scientist, but Hooper's an Ike Theologist. That's something, that's something more specialized. He's from upstate. He's a kind of a, you know, more smarty pants guy coming to this bumfuck area of USA to help solve this case and take down the shark. And uh, it's, it's, it's going to be crazy. But yeah, let's talk about the theme. This is a John Williams classic. Utilizing trombones, a tuba, and a few more instruments along with just two simple notes. Bum bum. Bum bum. Bum 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 dun 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 bum 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 This haunts me. Okay, as a child I was haunted by this theme. It's been used, again, just like many of the other songs on here, to great lengths and parodies. It, it, it's just so damn catchy and simple and perfect. And it does really elicit that fear in us, that, that, that looming threat in the distance. I can't see it, but I know it's there. And whenever the song kicks in, dun dun, you know shit's about to go down. Love it. Here's one that some might not be expecting on the list. Jigsaw wants to play a game with a bunch of bad people. And that game is redemption. Because Jigsaw, at the end of the day, is trying to help people in his own sick, sadistic way by putting them in the worst case scenarios imaginable. Hooking traps and contraptions and really weird things to them for them to try to get out of. Otherwise, there's going to be some bodily injury. And you just better hope that it, that it takes you out the first time around. Or it could get pretty brutal pretty fast. The theme... Hello Zepp is by Charlie Clauser. Piano, brass instruments. Uh, dun dun dun, dun dun dun, dun dun, dun dun dun, dun dun dun, dun dun. I, I, I might not have that beat or that sound very, very accurate. I just know that it's intense as shit. And when it kicks in, you know it's about to go down just like Jaws. Dun dun dun, dun dun dun. Dun dun, I, I, it's, it's, it's so good. It really plays off of all the hellish nightmare fuel that you're watching. Someone gets their face ripped off by a machine that's going to snap after 30 seconds. Jigsaw really doesn't put much time on the clock. You know, if he's really concerned for a lot of these people's well-being and, and really hoping to make them better, maybe throw more than two minutes on the board, dude. Sometimes they have to, like, soak out a bunch like cut out a bunch of their fat and squeeze it out to get some of the liquids into a jar which sets off a whole mouse trap situation make the guy hop into the pool and the cage comes down and that's mouse trap it's it's not good i'm starting to think jigsaw doesn't really care about these people at all all right two priests walk into a bar and order an exorcism I don't actually have a punchline for this setup joke. Uh, I just have a little girl that's very troubled. And she's very much possessed in the hit film The Exorcist. A, uh, a classic, a legendary classic that they're trying to bring back for the 50th time. It's like the fifth or sixth one, I think, that's actually part of the original. There's, of course, The Pope's Exorcist, The Exorcist of Emily Rose, lots of exorcism movies. But now they're trying to do the Halloween thing and bring it back with this new one that's supposed to be part of a trilogy. They paid $400 million for the rights to the franchise. Just completely asinine. And David Gordon Green's movie's not great. His first attempt at a modern exorcist film, not good. Not good. And we got two more of these? Good luck. Because I don't know how well this is being received. Well, it's not being very well received. I know that by critics. But what is well received is the theme song for The Exorcist. Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells was a happy accident. I actually looked this whole thing up. It's kind of fun. This is the quick synopsis. At only 19, he composed this piece for his own record, the Tubular Bells that I said. But after minimal success, it was later discovered by director William Friedkin during a meeting, or Friedkin, I apologize for naming, it was put in the picture shortly after. The piano work here is legendary, obviously. Essentially what happened is Mike tried to make a full album on his own at 19 years old. He had this song called Tubular Bells. It's really good. Finally got the album distributed, did not do well for numbers, didn't really make any waves. 
Later on, it's acquired by a different studio who put some of the music in front of the director of The Exorcist. He loved tubular bells, and that be the rest is history. It goes on the movie. People are very happy, except for, I believe, Mike, the composer. He's not, he's not too thrilled that it was kind of like just thrown on there without his knowledge. So there was some back and forth, and you know, you can look it up if you want any more information. But uh, kind of a fascinating story on its own. And really, I mean, my God, what, an, what a freaking great piece this is. The piano work is very haunting. It's, it's, it's beautiful in its own way. Not as beautiful as the next one on my list, which is from The Candyman. An urban legend becomes reality for recent college graduate Helen Lyle as she comes face to face with the Candyman. People need to stop calling it. Yeah, I, I noted this and I need to stand by it. People need to stop going in front of mirrors and saying the names of other things, spirits, demons, whatnot. Just stop saying shit. You don't need to go say Candyman five times in front of a mirror. You, don't, you certainly don't need to yell Beetlejuice a bunch of times or Drop Dead Fred. That, that's a full on nightmare. Drop Dead Fred's one of the scariest movies ever created. That character is awful and horrific in all the, all the wrong ways. Philip Glass composes what I really think is just like a pretty haunting song. It's way different than anything else on this list. Candyman is a really smart, sophisticated, layered movie that I think more people need to give a chance. I never gave it a chance until way later in life. I watched it two or three years ago for the first time. I thought it was gonna be some schlocky, lame B movie, but no, it's it's damn good. The shots, the way it's, uh, just everything about it, it's, it's really well done. The presentation's great, and the music is just another piece of that that really elevates the material. Okay, last and certainly not least, this is one of my favorite movies on the list, is The Shining. Jack Torrance takes his family up into the mountains where they will spend the winter in complete isolation at the beautiful Overlook Hotel. The good news, Jack takes care of that writer's block that he has. The bad news, Jack's not a great writer. In fact, he's also pretty redundant and sloppy. We get it, Jack, you're bored. Okay, we get it, you're a dull boy. Move on already. Well, he's got bigger problems. There, there's something going on at the hotel. His son has The Shining, which is a kind of a special ability, like a mutant power where he can see the dead, communicate. It's, it's a very, it's a rare ability. Some would say it's a disability, but I think that it's helping him in the long run. It's, it, it, it allows him to get away from his psychotic dad, who apparently has been at the Overlook Hotel for a very, very long time, at least in some fashion. This is a trippy movie. I'm a big fan. Stanley Kubrick made gold. He spun gold. And he also really liked the classical music in his films. This is no different. Wendy Carlos and Rachel Elkind. How do I say that? Wendy Carlos and Rachel Elkind. They used synthesized sounds from Dave Smith. God, I'm butchering. I'm, I'm at the end. I'm on my last leg and I can't, uh, I can't finish this off strong. They use synthesizer sounds from Dave Smith instruments. I don't know what Dave Smith instruments are. I'm not a musical guy. I like music a lot, but I don't know what that means. <laughs> what are Dave Smith instruments? In 1977, Dave designed the sequential circuits, Prophet 5, the world's first fully programmable polyphonic synth. And the first musical instrument with, okay, this is just, too, this is just a bunch of words. These are just a bunch of words I don't know. Bottom line is, this has an organ sound to it. Very disturbing, yet also kind of lovely. It reminds me of old ass giant cathedrals. And I grew up Catholic, so it kind of creeps me out because a lot of those cathedrals have creepy basements, dwellings, underground areas, usually just cement with some brick poles holding the place up. Anything goes down there. You walk down there, you're, you're basically in Sin City. Nobody else is around usually. Once in a while you hear a noise off in the distance in a dark corner. And that's where I feel like the Shining song kicks in. And I am, I'm out. I'm completely out. 
The song is brilliant. The movie is brilliant. And these are, I think, the best scary movie songs you can play at this time of year. You put these songs on at your front porch when the kids come up to get candy, they're either going to be dancing their ass off to some Ray Parker Jr. or they're going to be running for the hills with some Kubrick. I th either way, it's a win. Depends on what mood you're going for. Give them some Gremlins, give them some Beetlejuice, they have a good time. You throw in a little Halloween soundtrack. Yeah, they, they, you can even throw in a little Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. That movie sucks in my opinion, but man, that's a banger score. That's a banger score, especially that dun 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 Eight more days till Halloween, Silver Shamrock. Good stuff. I'll end on that terrible singing. Let me know your thoughts on my list. Do you agree with it? Do you have more to add? There's always more to add. There's always more to add. Put them in the comments below. Again, like the video, share it, subscribe if you're new here, whether it's the podcast or it's on YouTube. It's Taster's Choice, really. Subscribe to all of them. That's the ideal situation for me. Lastly, if you like the content I produce each and every week, you get several live streams, you get movie reviews weekly on new movies, you get a movie roast now almost every single week, which are very long to make, and I think they're freaking hilarious because I think I'm funny sometimes. And those are the ones that showcase the talent to me. And you get the podcast every single Monday. If you appreciate all this work, please think about joining me on Patreon at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies or become a member right here on YouTube via the join button. There is a $1 tier. And what better treat for Halloween than to say, hey, Adam, I'm supporting you for just one buck. Or, hey, Adam, I think you're worth $10 a month or $20. And there's, of course, different perks that come with these, like the exclusive 300 plus videos that you get and no one else. That's right. There are 300 videos that are only available for Patreon and YouTube join members. I, at a dollar, that seems fair. I'd buy that for a dollar, you might say. And then I would tip my fictitious hat and say, yeah. That's, that's a RoboCop quote. You get me. And hopefully I get you. All right, I'll leave it there. Have a great Halloween. Stay safe, of course. Eat plenty of candy if you want. I'm not big on candy. Uh, I'm more of a soda guy, which is equally terrible for you. But that's where I like to live. I'm going to be watching Sleepy Hollow with the family. Let me know what you're doing. All right, happy Halloween, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.